The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. As, as it clearly says, we're going to be discussing open source virtualization. Uh, specifically, we're going to be discussing Proxmox. Is anybody here familiar with Proxmox at all? One, two, and a half. Awesome. Okay. How many people here with, are familiar with VMware? Zen? Uh, Hyper-V? All right. This is the open source counterpart to that. Um, and uh, so it's going to be really, it's really, really cool. We're going to go through some of the basics of virtualization. Um, and for those of you that don't know, uh, virtualization is the creation of a virtual rather than a physical version of something Operate. operating. We good? A little higher. Is that any better? All right, cool. Uh, Creating a uh, virtual instance operating system, server, storage device, network card, whatever. You know, you, you can pretty much visual, virtualize anything in a computer. Um, we've got several types of hard, uh, virtualization. Uh, we're specifically going to be discussing hardware virtualization and a little bit of software today, but I won't go through all of them. Um, hardware virtualization um, allows one server to run multiple operation, operating systems at the same time decreasing the number of servers that are required uh, to, to run the same workforce. Software virtualization, if you ever booted Mac into Windows, boot camp, stuff like that, it's actually a, a software virtualization. This typically happens on individual computers rather than uh, entire networks. And desktop virtualization, um, VMware calls it VDI, it's kind of their proprietary system. Um, it's, uh, it's a concept of, of virtualization that's not limited to a single company though. Um, scenario, each computer's preferences, operating system, application files are hosted somewhere on the local machine. Um, uh, this has a number of benefits in end users for IT departments. Uh, a previous company that I had, we were using um, like terminal services and thin clients uh, with using running virtual machines. And this is, is really what the desktop virtualization is, is talking about. Uh, in hardware virtualization, there's three primary types of hardware virtualization. You have full virtualization, which is, just as it implies, it's everything's virtualized. From, um, you've got partial virtualization, where some of the environment is virtualized, but not in its entirety. Um, and then you've got para-virtualized, which is a hardware environment that is not simulated. However, guest programs are executed in their own isolated domains. The key with para-virtualization is typically you have to run some kind of modification on the operating system to get it to run. Um, VMware tools, anybody familiar with that? That is actually the, this, VMware is using pair virtualization and it's using the VMware tools to allow you to use the networking and all that good stuff. Uh, so that's where pair virtualization is coming in. Virtualization run, requires a hypervisor in order to run. A hypervisor is a piece of computer software, firmware, or hardware that creates and runs virtual machines. And there's two types of hypervisors that we traditionally see. First one's the type one. It's where you have your bare metal, then you have your hypervisor followed by your guest operating systems. Type two is you have your hardware, you have your operating system, then you have a hypervisor followed by your guest. And this is where we typically see VirtualBox and VM. You install it inside of Linux or Windows or Mac or whatever. And so you have a, your hypervisors one level up. We're mostly going to be dealing with type one today. And the example of that would be like VirtualBox or VM Workstation Player. There are several virtualization technologies that are, gonna, that are in use. One of them is KVM, and, and one of these gentlemen has actually asked me about that. Um, it's kernel-based virtual machines. Um, this is what... Uh, most of us are probably familiar with is for if you're using um, Zen, Hyper-V, uh, Hyper stuff like that. It's a, it's a, a full kernel virtual machine. And uh, it's an open source hypervisor. Uh, KVM is a full virtualization solution for Linux. 
uh, on x86 hardware containing virtualization extensions for Intel VT and AMD V uh, chipsets. Um, it, it's also a kernel module that's been added uh, to the mainline Linux. With KVM, you can run multiple virtual machines by running unmodified Linux or Windows images. It enables the user agile uh, to be agile by providing robust flexibility and scalability to fit their specific needs. Um, a little bit with this, I came out of an environment in my previous job where we were a Microsoft shop. We just we went from physical servers over to virtual servers, and. Um, and, and, and this is where I really got into, into the KVM stuff, is, was being able to run a mixed, operate, a, a mixed uh, set of machines in the same environment. I had, we had Red Hat servers running right next to Server 2012, and KVM is what, allows us, what allowed us to do this. OpenVZ, is anybody familiar with OpenVZ? Uh, anybody familiar with LXC? All right, cool, you, we're, we're, all, we're all in the same, the same ballpark if you know anything about those. OpenVC is a container-based virtualization for Linux. Um, OpenVC creates multiple secure isolated Linux containers, um, all the way, otherwise known as um, VE, VESs or VPSs. Um, if you are online and go to all these hosting sites and they're like, buy one of our VPSs, most likely what you're actually buying is one of these, one of these OpenVCs or an LXC container style virtualization. Um, it's on, on a single physical server enabling better utilization and ensuring that applications do not conflict by separating. The, the drawback to OpenVZ is it's only for Linux based um, operating systems. You can't run Windows in OpenVZ. But the advantage of OpenVZ is it is extremely lightweight. And we'll, we'll see that here in just a little bit. Uh, and specifically now we're going to get into Proxmox uh, VE or virtual environments and open source software optimized for the performance and usability for maximum flexibility. Um, we've implemented uh, two virtualization technologies, both KVM and OpenVZ. This is one area where Proxmox does stand out is that it offers two types of virtualization technology where most other solutions offer just one or the other or something different altogether. Proxmox uh, is a complete virtualization management uh, solution for servers. It can virtualize even the most demanding applications, workloads running on Linux or Windows servers. Uh, it, is, it is based on the leading uh, kernel-based virtual machine hypervisor as well as OpenVZ, and it is the number one solution for container-based virtualization. It is completely open source. And that's, that was a huge thing for me when I discovered um, Proxmox some three years ago. Um, it is released on, a, on um, an AGPL version three license. Um, so you're free to do whatever you want to with it. You can have fun with it. Um, Proxmox is, uh, it's extremely robust, um, but also the community is very strong and you can actually purchase a support package through Proxmox, but I'm, that's really for a different day. Um, but they do offer um, support packages. You got a question? AGPL instead of GPL, is there some mechanism where you can make modifications and deploy Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, it's, it's available through Proxmox, um, through their website. Um, uh, yeah, not sure on that part. I haven't, I haven't dealt with the source code of, the, of this actual platform before. Um, I've just, everything I've done was um, just straight off the ISO, so that's not something I actually, I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, it always gets complex when you start dealing with licensing. Um, Using open source software guarantees full access to all its functionalities as well as high security and reality. Rea 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 I'm not going to be able to get that word out today. Reliability. Um, everybody's encouraged to contribute. The Proxmox community right now is about 200,000 strong um, and it's growing every day. Um, and every problem that I've ever run into with Proxmox, I've been able to answer directly off the forums um, within just one or two searches. Uh, so the community is, is really, really awesome. 
Uh, it is based on uh, KVM, hypervisor, um, and OpenVZ, as we've already said. There's been some big milestones for Proxmox first release, April 15, 2008, with uh, Proxmox VE uh, version 0.9. Um, and they later um, implemented the GUI for managing the containers in 16 different languages, which was, was very nice. Uh, April 2012 yeah, was 2.0. Um, it does have a RESTful web API for any of you guys that are interested in that. Uh, high availability. Um, this is something that came around, I believe, in 1.7, um, and it's a huge feature, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. In 2013, over 40,000 hosts in more than 140 countries. Uh, this is a little bit misleading because that's 40,000 hosts that are registered with the support system through Proxmox. So there's considerably more of those out there. They just don't actually know about them because they don't have any. Um, actively, there's about 20,000 forum members right now. Um, and the cool thing is Proxmox VE 3.0 was just released two weeks ago. Uh, it's added some really nice features that Proxmox was lacking. The biggest one being the ability to clone VMs. Um, that hasn't been there pr previously, and so that's one of the biggest upgrades that they've added in just the last two weeks. Uh, we already talked about system requirements. Um, Proxmox is built off of Debian. So pretty much anything that'll run Debian 64-bit, you can run Proxmox on. Um, the, rec the recommendations, at least are dual uh, quad-core socket server, 64-bit, um, obviously. It has to support the Intel VT and the AMD V, which is the virtualization elements to the chipsets. Basically everything circa 2008, 2009 on pretty much does support these, um, these protocols with the exception of your really low processors like some of your Pentiums and, and, and things like that. Uh, at least eight gigs of RAM is good, but if you're like me, the more the merrier. You know, let's put 64, 96, 128, whatever you can throw into it. Uh, hardware RAID with batteries, um, you know, hardware protection. Uh, the fastest hard drives you can get is obviously at least two gigabit NICs and uh, fencing hardware, which is only necessary if you're running high availability. Fencing is a, let me, let me think of the easiest way to screen. Um, I'm not, I, I'm not well ver 100 percent well versed in fencing. Um, it's, it's a, in, in order to run high availability, you have to have a, a centralized network storage location that everything can communicate. You also have to have a centralized controller, and that's classified as, the, in, in, for Proxmox, is the, the, the fencing environment. It's actually what's controlling the high availability. Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit. I don't use high availability because I don't have a need for it. I'm not running a data center. I'm running um, a network testing lab out of the closet of my spare bedroom. Um, so, so some of the, some of the features that Proxmox have, I can't. I just don't have a reason to utilize them. Um, and I, as we progress, I really, really want to. But it, it all comes down to just a time. Yes, if you. We'll go through the minimum spec requirements, and, and this is, um, is interesting because this is, I actually use these on a daily basis a lot of times. Uh, obviously, 64-bit processor, one gig of RAM, hard drive, and a NIC. You can pretty much put it on anything. And in fact, I've got um, a Proxmox installation running on this dual-core Atom processor with two gigs of RAM. Um, and we're gonna sh I'll show that here in just a little bit. All right. Um, 
the, the installation process for Proxmox is ridiculously simple. You can go to proxmox.com, download the ISO. Um, I'm actually getting ready to install it, and it's going to be a little ironic because I'm going to install it in VirtualBox um, so that y'all can actually see the installation process. Um, I hope y'all see the irony in that of using a virtualization environment. But that's what we're going to do. Um, so I've already got the ISO downloaded, and we'll just select Debian, and we'll just give it a decent amount of RAM. Defaults will work for this. It is, it's going to take about um, probably about six minutes to go through the whole process, um, running through VirtualBox, installing it on a physical machine. Um, I installed it on one of these devices in about four and a half minutes. Um, so it's a very fast process. It's very easy. Um, it's like 10 clicks and a couple of bits of information, and you're done. So um, while this is loading, I can give you a little bit of backstory about how I, how I came across Proxmox and what I use it for personally. Um, about four years ago, I got into uh, network testing and penetration testing. And I was living at home with my parents at the time. And my mom didn't like the idea of me having 30-something computers. Uh, I don't understand why. Um, Something about power consumption, heat, overkill, ridiculous. Um, and, and, and right here, what I'm doing, just setting up the host name, giving it the IP address um, that I want it to have, and, I, and go through and start the installation. So that's you uh, give it your password, you set your location, your time zone, your uh, IP address, your host name, and that's it. And it's going to run. It will take just a couple of minutes to, to actually go through the install process. Um, but so I was wanting to do network te uh, testing, but I had a laptop and I had a desktop, and that was it. And I had a stack of hard drives, IDE hard drives, and I would keep installing things on these different hard drives and plugging and unplugging. And all of a sudden, I need a Windows machine. I jump over there. I needed a Linux machine. I keep switching out to to run all these different tests and stuff. And so it was a very inefficient system and I didn't and like VirtualBox or VMware wasn't a good solution either because I didn't have enough hardware to actually support what I wanted to do. It was running so slow having multiple VMs running that it just it kind of defeated the purpose of what I was trying to do. So in 2011 um, is, is when I stumbled across Proxmox and um, I'm getting a little feedback. And, and so I downloaded it and loaded it up on a machine, and I absolutely instantly fell in love with it because it meet, met every requirement that I had. Because the, the setup that I have at home, I have a a pretty robust server with its own. It's got its own. It's sitting behind its own router, and so from there I can take my laptop with uh, I boot into to Backtrack or Kali Linux or something like that. I can have. On a typical day, I'll have four XP Pro boxes running, um, a couple of Ubuntu boxes, two Windows 7 boxes, a Server 2003, and a Server 2008, all running from one box. So I, have, I now have my own little play network that I can do anything and everything that I want to and not disturb anybody else. Not, I'm not having to worry about messing somebody else's network or, it, or, or really anything. Uh, and the other problem is that I just didn't have access to equipment. You know, it's it went, up until the last couple of years, I'd never got to touch a Windows server or, 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 or things like that. So it was the, the fact that I didn't have the resources to do what I was actually trying to do. Proxmox eliminated about 95% of those issues for me. Um, so I started out, I installed 
It started on a uh, Core 2 Duo box with like six gigs of RAM, and that box is still running Proxmox today, two years later. Um, and and I, it, it's just, it opened up a whole world of opportunities. And also f through this, I was able to learn more about networking because it does have, um, you, ha you have two choices when you create uh, your containers or VM. You can actually use an internal NAT or you can actually bridge it to, to your local network. And typically what I do is I bridge it to my local network because it's sitting behind a router that I can connect to wirelessly. So I can simulate a lot of network attacks over, over wireless because um, that's typically where my bread and butter lies is um, fun stuff with wireless. All right, so it is, the installation's done. It didn't take too long. And just tell it to boot. adding the SSH key and all that stuff so that you can SSH into the box. Uh, also, the one thing that's really nice about um, Proxmox is anything you can do in the GUI, it's just as easy to do, to do in the command line. Um, I'm just now actually getting into the, learning the capabilities of the command line because the GUI just works so well for me right out of the gate that it, it just, I just kind of stuck with it. But it's nice knowing that I have the options to, to jump back and forth. Question? Does Proxmox arbitrate on its own whether you use KVM or OpenVM? That's something we're, we're going we're gonna to talk about here in just a, in just a moment once we, um, as you can see, the, the box is up and running now. And, and so what we'll do is I'll switch over to uh, 2.15. And of course, it's not wanting to work today. Not a problem. It helps if you're on the right wireless network. So how are you guys doing? <laughs> All right. Um, this, this here is actually the Proxmox interface that's running off of this box right here. Um, this one I've already installed previously. Um, when, you, when you log in, it's or go to the interface, you're greeted with uh, the login page. Proxmox supports multiple forms of authentication. Um, you've got the uh, Linux PAM authentication. You can use Radius. It has its built-in uh, built authentication server, uh, LDAP, Active Directory. So pretty much any form of authentication you're using in an uh, enterprise environment, Proxmox supports out of the gate. All right, so we're now in the, the GUI here. And uh, it's, let me open up the the list, and, and this, is, this, is, this is where I spend most of my time as far as with Proxmox. Um, as you can see, over in the left-hand column, under where it says self, you've got 100, 101. These are actually two VMs that are already established in, in this system, and if you notice, there's two different icons. One is this little triangle thing, and the other is actually a monitor. Um, one's KVM, one's OpenVZ, and, uh, and, and so, it allows you to differentiate there. We're gonna go through the interface just a little bit to show, and I'm actually gonna get on my knee to do this, which is gonna make for horrible video. We're first gonna start with um, storage. Uh, currently, uh, 64 gig SSD in here. Proxmox by default takes half the drive and reserves it for your virtual machines. So currently I have like 30, about 32 gigs available on a fresh install on this. Um, so if, if you're installing, doing local storage for your VMs, you, you understand. 
Um, Proxmox supports um, multiple forms of, of storage. You can, uh, you can just do a directory. You can actually mount an LVM group and NF share, which is what I do at home. I've got a, a NAS that, that's, run, that's actually running all my VMs um, and iSCSI and things like that. So you can, it's, you're not just tied to the local storage. You obviously can, can mount ex, uh, additional drives and arrays so that you can ha have a ridiculous amount of disk storage. Uh, but currently on this insta installation, I am running everything local. I, so on the local, I ha you'll have backups, your images, your ISOs, your containers, um, your clones, everything else is, is going to be here. But you can actually designate, if you have multiple uh, storage uh, with, uh, set up in this, you can actually say your clones go here, your backups go to this device. So you can actually segment where everything's going. <laughs> All right, so here's the self node, which is this here. We'll do a summary. You'll see that it's a, a two um, a dual core Atom processors, 1.8 gigahertz with two gigs of RAM. Not a lot, not a lot of hardware, but it actually works pretty well in running, especially the Linux containers. Um, so. What everybody's going to want to do is the first thing they're going to do is actually create something. So up here in the top right hand, you have two options. Uh, you can create a VM or you can create a container. And this is where the, you first start the, to decide what I'm going to do. Um, obviously, um, I'm not going to install Windows in a, K, in, in a VM, I mean, sorry, in a container because it doesn't support that. Um, most of the time, I'm going to install Linux in a container because it's a lot lighter weight, a lot more efficient. Proxmox includes what they, their little, they call it a, a download center, I guess. And um, it allows you, and hopefully it'll pull this up because I'm not, this machine's not, yes it will. These are all the, pre, is anybody familiar with Turnkey Linux? Okay, Turnkey Linux, they're based out of Israel. They're, they're, they're basically making pre-made packages for uh, different functions, different things like that. And they're using OpenVZ to, uh, containers to actually patch it, package them. And so Proxmox works with them. And you can see this entire list of just lots and lots of things. Has anybody ever installed Xenos? OK. Um, it's not too difficult, but it's not that fun either to actually install it correctly. I can actually just come up here to the top and we'll see if it'll let me. Well, if it would give me the box. Wonderful. All right, let's, let's pick a different one since I can't get it. Uh, anybody here do Joomla? Nobody? Okay. I, start, I started as a web developer in Joomla, so Joomla's where, where it's at for me, um, although I don't like 2.5. Um, and it, it's, it's not going to actually resolve right now, or it's going to fail when I try to download because I'm not connecting the internet. But I can actually go and download all these containers it, that, that they have pre-made. So I don't have to worry about creating them. They have uh, like Ubuntu 12.04, Debian uh, like four, or six, uh, 5, 6, and 7, um, uh, CentOS. Um, Fedora, they've got all these pre-made containers, so you can just, once you get Proxmox installed, it's literally you just start downloading and creating containers. I've already downloaded an Ubuntu 12.04, um, so I'm going to actually show you the process of creating a new Ubuntu container. So I'm going to go to create container, and I'm going to give it a, a host name, and we'll just call it test. And you go ahead and set your root password. You can choose your template, and currently I only have the Ubuntu 12.04, so that's the only one I can choose. But if you, the more you download, they'll all show up there. You designate your resources the way you do in most virtual environments. We'll just leave the defaults. You can, and this is where you get to choose. You can either choose uh, a routed mode, or you can do a bridge mode. 
Um, I typically just do routed and just assign it an IP address. I don't ever deal with anything with the DNS because it's, I'm mostly working inside of the network. I very rarely have them even connect to the internet. So it's, it's, it'll take about 45 to 60 seconds for it to actually create the container. And from there, then you're actually able to boot up. Um, is anybody familiar with um, uh, server providers? Well, like Leno, they're here hosting or uh, sponsoring. Um, they're, they're actually using, uh, I believe they're using KVM, I believe. Um, are they, they're not, okay, they're using, okay, they're using Zen. Um, and uh, another one that we, that I use at work is, is DigitalOcean, and they're, they're using KVM. But you're, because you have these containers, you're actually able to spin them up just really, really fast. Um, so in the time it took me to say that, the container's created, and, and now it's in my list and I can start it. And it, it's, it's, up and, it's up and running. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this VM, or this container here in just a minute. Now let's create a container for, or a, a VM for, I've got a little XP installation, so. The, the, the options for VM are a little bit more um, complicated, or you have more options. Uh, so we're gonna set as Windows XP. I've already got the ISO installed. So I'll leave everything default. I'm gonna bump up the cores, because it's Windows. It likes more memory than it, and processor than it needs. And in about the same time, it'll, it'll, the, this will finish out in just a few moments. It'll actually create the container. It actually says it was successful. So we'll start it. So do these, do the guest OSs perceive x86 virtual hardware? Yes. Running on an atom? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, he, what he was asking is if the, uh, the, the guest operating system are actually um, seeing the virtualized x86 hardware, and that's then that is. Uh, and this this particular atom processor is it has is a 64-bit, um, and 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 so it, it's seen as a true 64-bit. Um, all the hardware, if you if actually go into the XP, you can you'll actually see where it's assigned the two core. It'll it'll see exactly what I gave it. Um, right, that's saying so it sees it as an x86 type Intel processor yes. rather than an atom. Um, Yes, it, 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 is, it is a generic processor. Uh, same thing with AMD, it doesn't matter who the, what the product, it just sees it as a generic x86. Yeah, that is correct. Okay. Adam is yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, what about, is there any thought about running this on ARM? I don't know. Um, I, I would hope so, I really do, because um, the fact of, of all the virtualization platforms I've ever used, I, Proxmox to me is the most efficient. I ha, it has the, the least amount of overhead. Proxmox claims um, that running a KVM on Proxmox will give you about 97% of performance compared to bare metal. I think that's a little bit high to expect, um, but I have seen extremely good performance, um, whereas some other virtualization solutions not as well. Um, and so I would love to see them go to the ARM processor pro, um, in, in the future. I just don't know if they have any plans to do that. Well, yeah, I, that's, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, they were they were discussing about um, the the virtual uh, capabilities of the ARM processors currently. 
Um, that's I know that's something that's in the works. I'm not much into ARM, unfortunately, um, so I don't have much to add to that conversation. <laughs> um, you, you will see if you look down in the air con uh, in the so you'll see no accelerator found. That is one drawback to this particular hardware structure. Is it the while it supports KVM through the instruction set, uh, it doesn't ex it, it doesn't use the accelerator function that's built into Proxmox. Um, because it just, it just the, this particular chipset doesn't support it. But if you have a like a an i3 or something like that, you won't you actually won't see the excel, no accelerator found, and that's what it's screaming at me for. So I've got like currently I've got four four different VMs here. Um, going back to one of your questions regarding the the KVM and stuff, you can actually let's see, give me one second. You can actually come in and um, in the options, you can actually change. Like right now, I've got it, I've got it set for KVM virtualization, um, which I can actually disable that because I don't have the accelerator on this chipset. Um, but you can also s select a type of, of disk that you use, like a, a QEMU. Um, I, I guess most of you, if virtual um, VMware uses that stuff, so you can actually select the type of disk that it's using, uh, and the and the type of um, options that you have in like in VMware and, and other things like that, as far as your disk, and the, and the the type of virtualization and the controls that you have within KVM, you can also do that when you create uh, a container. So, in order, you you basically choose though, uh, in a nutshell, do I want it to be a container? I can run. Um, Ubuntu. In fact, we'll show you. I can create a VM of Ubuntu. Um, Um, a few things about um, Proc, uh, Proxmox is the fact that it does support clustering. Um, I, I don't use clustering a whole lot. I've, I do have a cluster at home, but I don't use it a tremendous amount um, because I don't use the high availability. And for um, in order to use a cluster, I would I would recommend you also use a high availability. But if you're familiar coming from an enterprise environment. Um, with, with, cl with clustering and specifically high availability. All those functions are built directly into Proxmox. You also have um, the ability to do live migrations um, as well as obviously your backups and now your clone features in the latest version. So let's start this Ubuntu box. Proxmox, um, it will support, it, it, on a single node, it will support up to 160 CPU so or cores and one terabyte of RAM. And the cluster is, is limited to 16 nodes. Um, so, you know, that's, if you maxed out each node, that's, that's a whole lot of power. Um, so there are, there are some limitations in it um, as far as the scale of the cluster that you can build. Um, but typically, the the maximum hardware that you can put in each node uh, is higher than a, some of the other of its competitors allows for. Um, Proxmox does offer a. Um, they have a Java-based VNC console that actually works most of the time really well. There's, there's, it doesn't work well on a Mac, um, but that's due to Apple's not wanting to use the latest Java for security reasons and things. Um, come on. And of course, in a live demo, it's not going to work ever.
do forgive me. Um, so yeah, this is this is uh, this is Proxmox in a, in a nutshell. Um, I don't I haven't used this in an inter in enterprise environment, um, although I do know some people that are. I mostly use it to do exactly what you see. I, I build a bunch of nodes, various operating systems, various functionalities, file servers, uh, FTP servers, uh, Active Directory, uh, LDAP, Open LDAP, something like that, so that I can get in and actually run a bunch of network penetration testing, um, figure out the vulnerabilities, um, can blow up XP boxes, especially SP2, like, like it's no business. And it allows me to do this in a, in a controlled environment that I, had, I, I didn't have the ability to do. Um, very few people in here can say, well, how many people have Windows Server 2008, 2003, two Ubuntu servers, four XP boxes, two Windows 7 Pro boxes running at their house right now? And that's the thing, is it gave me the ability to actually have a lot of resources in a small environment. And if I don't need something, I turn it off. If I destroy, if I, if I break something, make it so that it's unrunnable, unrun, which happens a lot in Windows, I just pull it down, start scratch, I'm back up in just a couple of minutes. So it's a really, really versatile environment that I went to, navigated to over Proxima, I mean, a uh, virtual box, because that's what I was using before, because it just has its natural limitations. I'm running on an operating system, so I've got all that overhead, and it's just chugging along. And so now I can have one dedicated box. I can take my router and my Proxmox server, and I can take it anywhere, plug it up, and I can be doing my work. I can do what I, what I enjoy doing. And I've, I didn't have that ability before. Um, so that's, that's how I use Proxmox in a networking, an open source networking lab. This met a need for me. Uh, it's not the ideal solution for everybody, um, but if you're like me and have the philosophy, it's free. It's for me. Um, I, it, I, that's. I don't know what it just did. Oh, Java's finally trying to come up. Um, so, is there any questions about um, I? We, I use, I came out of a, a VMware environment, um, and so looking at the, the, the capabilities that VMware had, I was just absolutely amazed because, like, this is the coolest thing ever. Like, having, we condensed from 16 racks of servers down to two racks of servers in a 10-month window at the company I was at, and that was, I was just amazed to sit here and see how powerful virtualization was because we just had waste, a lot of wasted space. Question? Yes. Um, my first introduction to Proxmox, it was pretty cool, but I've been using CentOS KVM. What, what would be the advantage of this over, the, over the, if, what I've been using? Um, I haven't used uh, Repeat. CentOS Repeat. KVM. Repeat. Okay. His question was, uh, he's using CentOS uh, KVM, and what's the advantages of Proxmox over that? Um, I've never used CentOS KVM, so I'm not 100, I, I can't say for sure. One big advantage that Proxmox has, and I'm not sure if CentOS does as well, but especially compared to the other virtualization platforms, is this is the management console. You don't have to have a second, a dedicated unit. Like with uh, VMware, you have to have uh, vCenter, and you either have to install that on a physical server or a virtual server that it's actually controlling which always kind of just baffles me a little bit. Um, but you have to have a separate box to manage that. You don't with Proxmox. It is its, it, it is its own management interface. And so that, that's one advantage. Um, as far as the, the comparison to CentOS, I'm just not sure. I haven't used it. Um, if it's, if it's a, a standard implementation of KVM, um, you get the nice pretty GUI. <laughs> I, and, and, that, and that helps a lot. Um, is being able to see what's going on, it easily modify. Um, I can go in and take one of these uh, VMs here, and I can s really. It's a demo. Yeah, it's it's locked. It's actually completely locked up. <laughs> that is unfortunate. Stay tuned next time. All right, yeah. 
Well, nope, it's still, come on. Let's close out. I think you've got several VMs spun up. Yeah, I've got a lot of, well, I've got a lot of VMs spun up, and, and I'm also running on a VPN and everything else, so um, I don't connect to open networks, so I don't trust them. On this box right here, um, oh, it's the limitation is 1,000. You can maintain 1,000 VMs um, on a single node. Um, I don't really want to know what the, the hardware specs for 1,000 VMs are. Now, but now on a, uh, if you're running 1,000 containers, that's actually not that bad. I mean, it's, most of the containers are um, using less than 500 megs of space. Um, you can run, because you can run Linux on such a, a lightweight plat, you know, you, you can give it 256 megs of RAM and one CPU core, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be happy all day long. Um, so if you're using container-based virtualization, you can really start to stack um, the, the number of v VMs or containers that you're running. And I am just going to get out. Actually, Firefox is locked up. <laughs> So we'll jump into Chrome. Really, you, whoever was asking about the advantage of looking at the advantage, you get that for your user interface instead of Vert Manager. It just does more stuff management wise. You know, I, I still okay. don't use Vert Manager anymore. I always just use the command line, so, you know, use your bar. bar sure. Well, yeah, and. Do you, do you, um, have, I, obviously, you use both. Yeah. Do you find uh, one is more robust than the other? One is, uh, yeah, it's a lot easier to manage VMs. use it to connect to multiple hosts over SSH yeah. and manage all of them at once right. with a tree. And, and I use the, uh, and I, I use more of like that. I mean, I, was, I use Burke install, I'll spin up some bit in a heartbeat. I'm just wondering how this compares. I mean, when I spin up VMs, I'll spin up 50 to 100 of them in a heartbeat. Yeah. You know? well, and I have to just, I'm doing it in a well, environment. I'm just, I'm thinking about this. Well, yeah, yeah the, and, and that's, that's one of those things that um, you're doing it command line, correct? Uh, and and that, that can get into a, a heated Linux discussion, GUI versus command line and stuff like that. But the, the biggest deal for me is that the, the point in time that I really jumped into this, I was still a newbie, and I, I still classify myself as, as a young gun in Linux. Um, and it, it catered to me because it, it had a GUI, and I could look at it and I knew exactly what I was doing or I could figure out exactly what I needed to do. Uh, now that I've got this under my belt, I've gone back to the command line, which is actually uh, a whole lot simpler. I mean, it's, you want to create a new, um, new container, it's, you just run PVE, create, give it the container number, and the template. Enter. And it, 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 does, the same, it does the same process um, that you're seeing in the GUI. The difference is, I don't have, if I, let's say I want to go change um, the IP address on, on, on a VM. Through, so I, I've got, I can SSH into it and I can do all that, um, or I can just do in the GUI just change the IP address. And it, 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 hand, it sends it all out through. Basically, you're saying the box box is your preferred, just basically on the GUI. Yes. I, 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 I like it for the, the, the two things. The user interface is very nice, especially from where it came from in 1.7 when I started to now. Um, this is much more of a, a, a VMware-ish kind of look and structure the way it is. Previously, it was a lot more convoluted. Um, but the, the, the fact that I was able to, to figure out what I was doing in the interface without any um, documentation or having to do a lot of research to figure it out, that was one plus. But also, it gave me the ability to choose KVM or um, 
OpenVZ containers, I could choose. I mean, if I, like I said, I can I can install ten Ubuntu servers on this box, or I can install Windows Seven. You know, and 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 that comes down to the operating system. But I have that option, and so I can create a, a Windows Seven box. I can create my ten ser Ubuntu servers, and I can spin them up as fast as whenever I need them. Um, the the thing with me personally is. I needed to build it because I was pulling machines up and down, up and down, because I was going after a specific attack vector, um, whether it was either a Java or, or something, something else within in my network testing. So I wasn't deploying 50 to 100 VMs at a time. I was spinning up one or two for very specific reasons, and then I could destroy them. And so that's why Proxmox was just a home run for me, because it, it gave me that capability and it's really, really simple to use. It's um, very, very, very intuitive. Once you jump in, you just go, oh, you just start figuring things out. And, and that's, the, that's the advantage over everything that I've used. I, and I haven't used a tremendous amount because um, I'm kind of stuck in my ways. It worked. It's, it hasn't broken for me, so I just haven't ventured out to that, to other things such as Zen and stuff like that. Um, but, it, but it all comes down about usability for the end user. If you're more comfortable in the command line, Proxmox probably, there's probably not a whole lot of advantage to, for you. Um, because now you can run this completely command line if you would like to, but you don't have to. You have, you have those options. Um, and it, it was cool because in this instance, I was able to learn how to run things like VPN servers on a vir in a virtual environment that takes some unique networking. And because everything, all the adapters and stuff are virtualized, so you've got to do some bridging and stuff. And, and that's, so I've used Proxmox as probably one of my biggest learning tools over the last two years is in everything, both um, in network testing and both just in my personal development of my Linux skills, networking skills and stuff, it all has existed in this platform. Everything I've done, stick it behind a router that I control, that I can do anything, I can forward my ports, I can do anything I want to with it. And, and now I have, it's, it's exactly what I need it to be. It may not be the perfect solution for, for you guys, depending on what you're wanting to do. I mean, this is, a, this is a playground for me, where most people use Proxmox and stuff like that as you know, sensitive data, production environments, enterprise environments, where they're running real machines, real databases and stuff. I use it to play around and to break things. Um, but it's, it's, I, it's absolutely ideal for that. You want to run um, a PBX server and a VPN server, and somebody throw out something out there to me. DNS. Huh? DNS. Okay, yeah, well, I anything. I can actually set up all these in one, you know. I'm not married, and this is something I'm going to have to deal with later. I have, a, I have an entire rack of equipment that I know will probably go away the day I get married. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, pro, yeah, yeah, yeah. And if I want to get married, it probably need to. Get, yeah, it probably will want to go. But the the awesome thing is, as hardware as hardware expands and we get more capabilities, my my rack is actually getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Because in the last few years, my needs hasn't changed. I need to be able to run because there's still so many companies that are running Windows XP. Don't know why. Well, actually, I do know why, but. I still use XP for, for my testing environment a lot of times. So my needs haven't changed, but my, my footprint has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller as I just keep upgrading the box. The box right now is an i7 with 32 gigs of RAM and four terabytes of storage. And I can run, um, I, I typically at any given time will run um, six to seven VMs at one time. And most of those are, most of those are gonna be Windows. And I will, then I just connect to the, to the router wirelessly and it's open season. So, and if anybody's curious as to all these network things of t testing and stuff, uh, Sunday at 11:30, I believe, I'm doing a conversation on "Don't be a target." Um, and it's it's much more fun than this. Um, it's essentially uh, some of the dangers that that exist in by connecting to open networks such as the self network. Um, although I'm, I'm, I'm sure the self network is just fine, um, but um, a lot of what I've learned and, and what I'm going to be presenting.
came directly out of the research that I was able to do in Proxmox. So, any other questions? I've only ever run one, um, just because it's it's been isolated. Uh, he was asking, uh, what are the the limitations on how many networks you can run? Um, and I've also only ran one one NIC as well. Um, you can actually Proxmox will support up to sixteen network card interfaces, I believe. Yes. Yes, yeah, you, you, you can, and I run, I run mine as a, in, a, in, a, in a bridge mode so that my router's actually doing all of the routing. Um, you can also do it, and in, in it, it has its own NAT inside of it, but the issue with that is I can't connect to it externally from my, with my laptop. And I want to be able to run wireless te you know, packet captures, so I've hooked it up, run it as a bridge mode through the router, so the router's actually routing all the packets so I can actually sniff the packets and all that fun stuff. Um, I actually, I, I use one of the routers that my company, um, we, we have uh, currently, I've got an uh, Asus N66U, um, but I've used everything from TrendNet, Belkin, it doesn't matter. Um, because it, it's, I, I, just, I just need it to, to have a wireless network and route. Um, obviously things like port forwarding and stuff, I do like to have the ability to do that for my network testing, um, because you'd be surprised how many companies have ports wide open that should never be open, ever, and they're just sitting there on the, on the internet. So um, I like to try to simulate that as much as possible, so I, I will throw random, really, really bad network configurations and firewalls onto the router to, to see how I can get through them and bypass them and stuff like that. Uh, one fun thing to do is to, to tunnel from IPv6 down to IPv4. A lot of routers don't know what to do with that, so it just lets it through port 80, so you can always get in. Um, there, there's, there's some interesting things that, I, that I've learned as a result of, uh, of using Proxmox. Uh, it's a phenomenal, uh, you said ac academic. For me, this is a purely educational platform. Um, because it has, it has taught me, every, uh, not everything I know, but a lot of what I've known, and it's given me the ability to simulate real world applications. I could actually go to somebody and say, this is what could happen to your network, and watch them cry. And that's, that's, that's nice. <laughs> because it's open source. Uh, no, it, 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 and like I said, this is, this is how I use Proxmox. Uh, it's 100% not its actually intended purpose. They designed it to go into enterprise to replace things like VMware and Zen. Um, have edit and go to it. I, I know that it's more than capable enough to do that. But I, I think, especially as a, as a, as a my techno lust ha wants me to um, use utilize the technology that's available. There's no reason that this just has to exist in, um, in the enterprise level. The, one of the things we're doing at my company is we're developing a new x86 routing platform. And part of the, the whole idea behind this thing is it's why have all this really powerful hardware only available at this certain level when you're you know, running data centers and stuff? Why not bring it down to the average user? It's available. It's just nobody's taking the time to do it. Um, and so with Proxmox, it's like I have this really, really powerful open source platform that was designed to do this, but I'm going to go over here and do this with it. And that, that's, that's, that's Proxmox for me. I love it. I, I use it almost every single day. Um, so have fun. Any other questions? Sorry all the demos just went, yeah. There, yeah, it's, and, and I'm terrified that the next session is going to be worse. So, huh? It's interactive. You can't. You can't. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing.
Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication. From Wicked. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a, is a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, 
in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, 
allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Astros cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Astros convoy communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.